Hansen, who's coming from McGill, um, who's going to talk about us about this fabulous new tool that she's been working on called Neuromaps. The paper was published October. October. Yeah. Um, this tool is open source, and it's actually a really good example of um, being able to use uh, disparate data um, mm -hmm. and merge them to help get a better understanding of the dependencies and also use it to help drive your own experiments. So I'll let Justine walk through um, the platform, then we'll open up for questions, help some discussion, and we'll be done. We enjoy the rest of the rainy Friday. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Randy. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of intended to be pretty informal, so feel very free to kind of interrupt me with questions. Um, I'm going to be giving, I'm going to go through some slides. It'll be the more detailed version that I usually, so sometimes if I talk about near map, I give like the very big picture version, but this is going to be like the more kind of technical, it's really aimed at to help you guys use it instead of just thinking about like hypothetically what it could be used for. So yeah, feel free to interrupt me. And then at the end, I was thinking of doing just kind of a live coding demo where you'll see me do all my typos and you know forget how to do it anything, <laughs> but it'll give you an experience of like seeing how, how it's actually used, like live, and also hopefully like if I do come into things that I'm not sure how to do, I'll, I'll look it up and so you also see how the expectation, of course, is not that you just memorize how to use it, like there's kind of a sense of what to Google for and like where to search for things. Um, yeah, and that like you can code along or you can just watch or do. So yeah, the paper is called Neuromaps Structural and Functional Inter Interpretation of Brain Maps, which is a bit vague. Um, before I begin, I'll just Shout out Ross Markello. So he was a PhD student in the lab. I'm a, so I'm a PhD student in Bratislav Mesich's lab in, um, at the MNI in Montreal. Ross was a PhD student. He graduated a couple years ago, and he was really like the muscle behind lots of the software. Um, so shout out to him. And then Vince, I am calling out here because I have stolen or adapted some of his slides. So I just want to make that clear. So I usually like to start talking about neuromaps with this kind of metaphor, which is that we imagine the earth and the brain kind of, that's, that's what the metaphor is. And if you can think of like exploring the earth, one of the first things we might do as early day explorers is kind of map out the geography, which is obviously useful and like important. But once we have that, depending on what you're interested in, you can kind of layer on top of that with whatever phenotype you want to, you're interested in studying. So for example, if you're interested in energy um, consumption or energy use across the globe, you can get your own map of that. If you think brain terms, maybe that's like metabolism, glucose metabolism or oxygen metabolism in the brain. Um, these are supposed to be cell towers, so like if you want to know a map of cell signal in the, in the, uh, on the Earth, in the brain that might be like the density of a specific receptor. So for example, if you know the density of a specific serotonin receptor, you're going to have an idea of which brain regions are listening for that serotonin signal um, better than others. Maybe you want to know where your text messages are going to be sent very quickly. In brain terms, that could be like myelination, so more myelination in the brain, less myelination in the brain. Um, <laughs> no and um, each of these individually are you know, useful and kind of have their own fields and subfields of people studying that. But then as we start to like, layer these different phenotypes on top of one another, one another let's add in like, connectivity and whatever force ratio and river systems, um, we not only get just a more comprehensive view of the Earth, but we also get an idea of how these different layers are interacting, interacting with one another. So what do we need to do this? We need data. We need all the different maps. Um, we need them to be represented in the same way so they can be quantitatively compared. And then we need these robust methods or like proper statistical methods to make comparisons between these maps. That's what Neuromaps is trying to do for the brain. Um, so what is this exactly? It's an open source Python toolbox. Are there any like non-Python users here? Do you guys use Python? Yes, okay, great. So it's always awkward when I, when I do this and everyone's like, oh, I'll use MATLAB and I'm like, well, this is... Anyway, so it's an open source Python toolbox. Um, it is aimed at placing the human neuroimaging data within the broader neuroscientific context. So what do I mean by that? It's trying to take us away from being very kind of zoned in on a specific field, which don't get me wrong, that's obviously very important. We need to kind of be experts in our field before we can branch out. But it's trying to make it possible, especially now with the advent of all these big data sets that are becoming more and more available. How do we bridge those gaps to different disciplines? How do I make a link? Like, for example, if I was a, an fMRI researcher, how do I make links to like genomics, to um, PET imaging, to MEG? Like, when, do it, when, when does fMRI ever like work with MEG, right? But like, now it's starting to become more and more possible to do that. So more specifically, Neuromaps is there for accessing, transforming, and robustly comparing human brain maps. So here's the general workflow. Um, it is very modular, so you can kind of take what you want. You don't have to use the whole thing. You've got to take the pieces that you're interested in, and I'm going to start with the library part. Um, like I was saying with the Earth analogy, these are like the, the different data maps that you'd want to compare your data with. So I'm going to go through kind of some of the data sets that are included in Neuromaps right now, and on the bottom is just an example of the code for how to fetch it. We like to talk about these maps. We call them annotations. Neuromaps used to be called brain notation before it was like, like very early days, so that's why everything was like annotation-based. 
Um, but just imagining like taking a brain and literally annotating it with information like receptor densities or metabolism or whatnot. So here's some um, metabol metabol metabolic maps that we have, things like blood flow, blood volume, um, oxygen and glucose metabolism. Just, I'm gonna shout it right now, these, a lot of these, they were either uh, previously open or we asked whether we could put them on your maps and share them like openly that way. So this is not data, it's not that I have gone and like conducted you know, 70 experiments and like collected all these, like not at all. Um, this is, is kind there of, any restrictions in it if, if it's derived from a secondary source that we can't access it unless we get city clearance? No, so you can access all the data on your maps because all of them are group averaged. So there were restrictions about sharing like individual level data. There's a lot of like ethical restrictions there. So all of these are group average kind of healthy control. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I mean, one thing I'll say this later as well is like, if you do use data from your maps, don't forget to cite the people who actually like, made that data available. Don't just cite your maps because of course we're not the ones that actually collected that. So yeah, some metabolic maps, microstructural maps, things coming from um, MRI like T1, T2 ratio or critical thickness. Um, functional maps, so intersubject variability, that's variability in functional connectivity across a bunch of people. And you can see like, so the example code that I have for this map, um, we label all the data based on the source that it came from. So in this case, it's a paper Mueller et al. 2013. Um, a description of it, the space and the density. Um, we have these expansion maps, which I think are very cool. So what this is, is it's describing how the surface area of brain regions are changing across either ontogeny or phylogeny. So more specifically, it's going from either macaque to human or from child, infant, baby brain to adult. So you get an idea of where in the brain it's being expanded more or less. Um, what's, the, what's the upper limit of that age range? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'll, yeah, I'll have to look. So a lot of these maps, I mean, I'm familiar with them, but I might not know like there's like 70 of them joining, so I don't yeah, know like yeah, all sure. the details of all of them. But to kind of mitigate that, we have this, this I'll show you later, we have this massive table that trying to tell everybody like where to go for the original, you know, because otherwise it can become a bit of a mess, like where is this data coming from, or um, what does it actually mean, what are these values? Um, yeah, these electrophysiological maps, these are coming from HEP's um, MEG data sets. So this is six different canonical power distributions for different uh, frequency bands, and then also this intrinsic time scale map. And if you have questions about specific ones, I'm happy to, to talk about that. And then we have this like genetic map. This one actually stands out a little bit because it's the only map where we kind of upsample data. So everything else we just make available in the original data space. But this one is coming from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. Um, and the coverage isn't complete. So this is actually an upsampled map to 10,000 vertices per hemisphere. And it's just the first principal component of the, that, that gene expression, but I'll just shout out. Abigen is the software toolbox that Ross, so Ross the person who's also like very involved with this, um, he developed Abigen before Neuromaps, and it's like super handy when it comes to fetching genetic data. So if you want to do that like gene specific, then I, I recommend using Abigen. Uh, and then I'm going to devote an entire slide to receptors because I was working on a receptor project kind of at the same time as Neuromaps, and so I was involved in trying to put together all these receptor maps from different institutions um, to get this kind of atlas of 19 different receptor densities across the brain. I am showing the parcellated version here, but the data is available in volumetric form, so it does exist in the subcortex too, and, and yeah. And then we do have a contribution pipeline. This is important to mention because the data sets that we have, like as much as we're trying to be kind of very diverse and let people have a very wide range of phenotypes or annotations to compare their data with, um, it is naturally biased, first of all, to the history of neuroscience, like the things that we collect in things that people have been interested in, in studying over the past few years, but also it's biased towards like my interests and our labs, my lab's interests, um, because we're the ones that put this thing together. So if there's something that you think is missing that you would want to include, we do have a pipeline to do that because the goal is to be kind of as comprehensive as possible. And then this is just my note that do please cite the original contributor when you use your maps. So this is the massive table, it's just a screenshot and it cuts off early, but this is connected. I mean, you can access this through our, um, the GitHub page, so our docs and, and the wiki. And it goes through and describes all the different annotations that we have, so all the different data maps, of which there are, I think, 70 something. A fuller, like a more uh, detailed description of what that is. So for example, the receptor data is organized by, like the description is the tracer, and people don't, I don't expect you to know what tracer is mapping onto which receptor, like that value pride is, D2, I think, yeah, D2, or you know, whatnot. So there's a more complete description of like which one's which. One's which. And then very importantly, like who to cite, where to go for all the details about where that data was acquired, um, as well as things like number of individuals included in that map, because these are all healthy controls, they're all group average, um, number of males and females, and age ranges. For the most part, the data is younger individuals, 
we were thinking about kind of doing a near map 2.0 for like an aging data set, kind of do something similar, but in older individuals, because a lot of, like, we had a lot of questions when we first put this out about, you know, if I'm working in a specific disease subtype, I'd, I'd really like to do these comparisons, but it's probably a bit more relevant to me to be looking at older, you know, older adults. Um, yeah, so that's possibly going to happen. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so that's the library. Um, what we do when we make the data available is that we make it available in the original coordinate system or space in which it's available. So, you guys, are you guys cool with what coordinate system? Slash, but yeah, okay. So, um, we were like when we were putting this together, we were thinking about how do we make this available to, be, to people? Do we first like parcelate it all to one parcelation and make it available in that form? But then, of course, if you don't, if you're not interested in that parcelation, it's not useful. Or do we like transform into a bunch of different spaces and make them available in all those spaces? But that's just a very redundant; it would take tons of space. So in the end, what we decided to do is we make them available in the original space, so that we're not tinkering with the data, and then we provide you with the tools to transform between spaces or to parcelate if you need to do that. Because of course, we need them to be in the same space to be able to um, quantitatively compare them. So that's where the transformations come in. So just to give an example, here is a data map that's not in uh, near maps because of kind of data sharing restrictions. This is a um, deformation-based deformation -based morphometry map of schizophrenia, uh, case risk control. But so you can think of it as cortical thinning. And let's say that you want to compare this map, which is volumetric, M9152 to millimeter, to like cortical thickness, T1, T2, the first principal component of gene expression, um, and this allometric scaling, which is a developmental expansion map. But cortical thickness and T1, T2 are in FSLR32, like FSLR uh, surface, which is 32,000 vertices per hemisphere. And PC1 gene expression is FS average, which is 10,000 per hemisphere. And this one is civet, which is 41,000. You know, so it's just kind of a mess. How do I make that comparison? And so that's where we kind of provide these transformation tools. Um, so here are the different spaces that we work with. Uh, M and I across different volumes, not just, sorry, different resolutions, not just the two millimeters, so one, two, three. Um, Civet 41,000. 41, um, I don't know how many people are really using Civet, but we're, I'm from the MNI, and we were the ones that developed Civic, so of course we had to include that. And then we have FS average across different um, densities. It, like you guys probably know, but it's usually referred to as things like FS average 5, FS average 6, like it has these names. We just refer to them based on the number of vertices because that's really what we need to know, like how big is this array. Um, and then FSLR 32K and 164K, and we actually also have 4 and 8,000, which is not, those aren't used very often, but they are sometimes used for the MEG data. So the way that we go from volume to surface is we're using registration fusion, which is something that was first introduced in this paper, Buckner et al., um, 2011, and then it was kind of expanded on and implemented in this paper, Wu 2018. Let's see that. Yeah. Um, from Thomas Joe's group. And what they're doing is that they map the subject's native T1 image. So they do this for every single subject. They map the T1 image to MLI 152 space and then map that same T1 image to FS average. In this case, they were doing the, one, the 164,000 vertices per hemisphere. And then they can concatenate those two mappings to get a mapping from MLI 152 to FS average. So what we did is we did what they did, but then for everything else. So we did it for FSLR, for Civic, and for the other um, densities in the FS average space. And then to go from surface to surface, so that's why the M9152 is, can you see my mouse? Yes, M9152 is not there. Um, we're using multimodal surface matching. So just to give you an example, let's say we want to go from FS average to FSLR. What we do is we take the suckle depth map. So this isn't necessarily like an annotation. This is not like some sort of receptor density or whatever. It's just literally the geometry of that template that FS average is using. So you have the version for FS average, we have the version for FSLR, and then we project that onto the sphere. And so you can see where there's more depth or less depth just in the geometry of this brain. And then we try to match these up. And you can actually see just by looking at them that there is, you can kind of see how you might do that, how you might try to align these two maps. And the answer, of course, is to rotate one of them. So what we do is take the two spherical projections, we rotate them so that they're matching. You can kind of see, and of course it's not perfect because they're different surfaces, like they have different maps, but you can see it's pretty good. And then we apply that transformation to data. So for example, this is just an is that example. A mm -hmm. Linear transformation? These are linear, yes. The registration fusion is nonlinear and this one is linear, I believe. Okay. Yeah. This rotation is probably off. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so this is just an example of data. This is the GABA-A receptor density data. It's originally available in FS average space, so 164,000 um, vertices per hemisphere. So here it is on the spherical, spherical mesh, and then we can deform that using that transformation that we applied just from the cycle depth maps, and then project that back onto FSLR, and you can see we went from FS average to FSLR. 
So here I'm showing, we actually like did this. So at the top, the original map was an MLI 152 two millimeter map, and that's how it looks in all the different spaces. So this is the original data, and then we just apply the transformation. You can see visually it looks pretty good. Like the shape of the brain is different because these are just different surfaces, and I'm plotting them on an inflated surface. That's why they're kind of balloon shaped. Um, but yeah, they look pretty good. And then we also do it for the different surfaces. So here the original is the 10,000. And you can see how it looks when you, and so in this case, this is not something that's default. Like the default on neuromaps maps is always to downsample because you don't want to like create data, right? So if you're going from FS average 164K, or if you want to compare two maps, one is 32K, one is 164K, the recommendation is go, to go from 164 to 32. But just as an example, we started on the lowest 10K and we we're converting it, which includes map sampling, which we don't recommend, but just to show that we can do it and it does look good. And you can see kind of on the bottom, the example code again, um, if you want to go from FSLR to FS average, the function is called FSLR to FS average. Like it's hopefully pretty, uh, pretty, yeah, easy to follow. This just, I mean, my own personal opinion. <laughs> I mean, I think neuromaps, all of neuromaps is great, but I really think the transforms. Like for me, at any rate, in my own work, like when I use neuromaps, it's the transforms that are the game changer because it just can be such a pain otherwise. Like to figure out how to get this data in the same space, and these have been like really helpful. I mean, the data is great too, and but yeah. Um, yes, we do parsellate. So if you're like me and you work mostly at the parsellated level then as long as you provide the file of your parcellation, so that means whatever the mapping in whichever space, so MLI-152 or FS7 or whatnot, that goes from that to, let's say, Duskin Kiliani or Schaefer 400 or Brainatome or whatnot, as long as you provide that file, we will parcellate the data. So that can also save some time because, I don't know if you guys know, but for me, when I parcellate data, every parcellation is like in a different format, so you always have to figure out how they store their data and it like, takes way too much time. So this is hopefully there to kind of ease that. Um, yeah, so at this point, let's say that you have a data map that you collected in your, in your lab and you're interested in and you want to kind of relate this to different phenotypes across the brain like gene expression, receptor density, metabolism, um, functional maps, etc. So you have the transformations to make that possible. You can put them on the same space and theoretically you could just like calculate your correlation coefficient and your parametric p-value and like walk out the door and like you're done, which is true. You could do that. But I'm going to try to make the case for applying these spatial null models instead of using a parametric p-value um, because the brain is spatially autocorrelated. So what that means is that the brain, um, because it exists in space, it just has this kind of fundamental property which exists for all, all sorts of things, not just the brain, which is that brain regions that are close together tend to be more similar to each other than brain regions that are far apart. So two, two brain regions, like two random brain regions, are not independent from one another because they have this relationship of distance that is um, connecting them. So here's a simulation that Ross did for a different paper. Um, he is simulating completely random data. So as you can see, the correlation is zero. It's very random, that's expected. And then he's uh, slowly tuning a smoothing parameter of these two maps, and they slowly, as he uh, ups that smoothing parameter, the correlation coefficient gets bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. So even if the underlying data is random, um, as long as there's smoothing, enough smoothing, you're gonna get a nice correlation that's not necessarily real. I mean, it's real, but it's not representing, um, it's not meaningful. So just to give you an example, if we go back to my brain, uh, my earth analogy, it's a bit like you telling me that all these maps are very correlated to one another because they all exist on the land masses and none of them exist in the middle of the ocean, which is like true, but like not so meaningful. Like it's not gonna help me kind of deduce how they're interacting with one another or related to one another. So how do we deal with this? Um, just, I'm sure you guys already know this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, we are going to be developing spatial null models to assess the significance of correlations or any similarity metric above and beyond the effect of spatial autocorrelation. So what we do is we take our two brain maps and we just get our empirical correlation coefficient. Then we generate a bunch of null maps. I'll talk about how we do that. Calculate a correlation coefficient for each of these null maps. And then because of that, we get a null distribution of our null correlations. And then so your empirical correlation, so here, this is my real correlation and my null distribution of um, null correlation, so correlation between the real map and the spun map. And then you count how many of those, how many times like, the null is larger than your empirical, Oops. and you want p to be less than 0 0.05, I mean, depending on what your threshold is. And of course, multiple comparisons if you're doing multiple um, correlations. So what, how do we do this, how do we get these null maps, that's the question. So here's an example of empirical data. You can see that it's quite smooth. And But by the way, even if your data, like when you plot it, even if it doesn't look smooth, you should still be using spatial um, autocorrelation preserving null models because the brain is always going to be dependent on, like brain regions are always gonna have this dependency of space or just distance. So here are the naive models that don't take distance into account. So the parametric where you're estimating a Gaussian on your, on your data, that would be like if you just do like a 
Pearson's R in, in Python. Um, and the non-parametric version where you're doing the permutation testing, but the way that you're making your null map is you're shuffling random, randomly the brain regions. So the reason these two aren't appropriate in this case is that both of them assume independence between observations. And in this case, our observations are brain regions. So for example, if you were to do a purely Pearson's correlation where your observations are people and you're assuming independence between them because they're not related or whatever, that's totally fine. Like that's, that's okay. But in this case, our observations are brain regions and two brain regions that are close together, if we shuffle them randomly so that they're not far apart, there is a relationship that has been broken there, like the relationship or has been changed. And so because they're not independent from one another, we can't just assume independence and randomly shuffle them. Does that make sense? Okay, I know I can get very soapboxy about this, but. Uh, okay, so here's an example of some spatial null models. These are called uh, spin tests. So what we're doing here is we're taking our empirical data, we're projecting it onto the sphere just like we did for the multimodal surface matching uh, previously in the transforms. We spin that sphere and then just project it back down onto the surface. And so what you get is you can see that your brain map here, it's, it's wrong now in the null model, like it's not the same. So this is a null map that no longer represents the thing that you were interested in, but the parcels, all the neighbors are the same. So the parcels that are red are still next to other red maps and the blue ones are still next to other blue ones. There's another version, these are uh, par parametrized or generative data models. And here what we do is we take the, your empirical data and then you estimate a, using generative model, you estimate the spatial autocorrelations and the autocorrelation of your data and create new data from that. So instead of, so the spin test is purely geometric, it's just taking the surface and spinning it, whereas this one is based on your data and is trying to estimate new data with a similar um, spatial autocorrelation. And again, um, code down here kind of gives you, gives you an example of how it works. You need to provide your data, um, the space that it's in, whether or not there's permutation, how many, uh, sorry, whether or not there's parcelation, how many permutations you want to do, and then you get the rotated data as an output. So when do you use which one? Because I know there's like a lot of different versions here named based on who kind of first introduced the version, except for Hungarian, which, so all these are like the names of the people, and Hungarian has something to do with it being Hungarian, but I'm not totally sure what. Um, yeah, so the naive oh, models. Hungarian restaurant. <laughs> yeah, exactly, something like that. <laughs> There's a uh, student in the lab who is Serbian, and he always uses Hungarian because he feels like he ought to out of like nationalistic pride. But then I was like, but it's, it's Hungarian, it's not Serbian, so that, isn't that like kind of actually opposite? Like wouldn't you want to not use Hungarian? Anyways, so yeah, you can choose. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's what it is. Um, okay, so the naive models, they give inflated p-values, so that's not recommended. Now, which one should you use here? Um, sorry, I have a zoom bar that's blocking. Yeah, so the spin versions only work for the surface. They only work for the cortex. So if you're interested in subcortex or you know, brainstem or cerebellum, it's not gonna work there because it's dependent on the fact that you have this f average or epistolar or whatnot surface, which is only cortical, and then you can project out to the sphere. So with that, without that step, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, the parametrized work for both volumes and surfaces. It's a bit more comprehensive. Um, the spatial null models, some of them give, um, I mean, imperfect, that doesn't mean that it's not recommended. It's like, I usually actually use the Vasquez Rodriguez version. Um, but it just means that sometimes it'll duplicate the index or the data when you spin it. The reason it does that is because it tries to, these versions will try, when it does the spinning and then when you're trying to project that back down onto the surface, it'll try to match the closest um, parcel to your spun map. And if you have two parcels that are, that are both equally, or both close to the same sphere, like the parcel on the sphere, then they'll have the same map. Whereas these later ones, the Vasa, Vasa and the Hungarian versions, they will purposely um, make sure that each index only shows up once. So it kind of depends a little bit on whether or not you're okay with having duplicates in your data, but both are fine. Um, these two, you'll, you can see that the medial wall, so that's kind of the big uh, problem here is, so what we do is we always spin one hemisphere at a time, and one hemisphere is gonna have this big medial wall that we're not interested in, and so when you project onto the sphere, you're gonna have this chunk of your sphere that's the medial wall, so when you spin it, you're still gonna have that medial wall that's like there. So some of these, the medial wall will still be in there, so you'll just have to like correlate, but ignoring the NaN values, like ignoring the medial wall values, or you can have other versions that kind of uh, avoid this. Um, it can depend whether you're working a parcelated or non-parcelated, which ones work, the parametrized, in theory, work for both parse data and, vo and voxel or vertex level data, but I like don't recommend using it for the voxel and vertex level data because it takes a really long time generating that many vertex. Like, if you imagine, like, okay, at the vertex level, it's maybe doable, like on the order of hours, but at the voxel level, it just takes like a lot of time, but also a lot of like memory. So I can't do it on this laptop. Like, it would need to be done like on the cluster somewhere. Um, so yeah, I would not recommend. But I, I guess good luck if you want to try. <laughs> like, I believe in you. 
So those are the spatial nulls. So at this point, we have our, our map that we've collected empirically. Or if you're interested in a map on your maps, of course, that could also be the map that you're looking at. You can now compare it to a bunch of other data. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. the generative nulls, are they, are they the same for all different data sets? So you've got, like, for example, the blood flow, you've got genes mm -hmm. and so on. The spatial null models and the computation that can be used for all those. Yes. Yeah, so the null models can, can be used for anything that is at the parsellated or surface or voxel level. So it doesn't matter so much what the data is, okay. just how it's provided. So that's the, yeah, exactly. So, so that's one thing about near maps. Like when I mentioned that it's modular, one thing that means is that you don't only have to use the spatial nulls for near maps data. Like you can have your own data and not be interested at all in the transformations or the library and just want to use it to calculate, to calculate your map that you've collected empirically in your... Yeah. You know, analysis and get rotated versions of that. Yeah. But yeah, the generative models and the spin models. The spin just requires the surface, so it doesn't, even, it doesn't matter what your data is. And the generative models just need to have an, an idea of the spatial correlation of your data, which so then in that case you do need to provide your map. But yeah. But yeah, it doesn't matter the modality. It does make a difference how smooth your data is. So generally, if you like, for example, pet data, if you just like look at that, it's generally much smoother than. Like noisier data. I mean, pet is also noisy, but yeah. So if it's very smooth and you do the spins, your p values will generally be higher because the smoothness, you'll get a lot of kind of erroneous correlation coefficients just because it is so smooth. Whereas if you have data that's not very smooth, um, that, I'm just going to not look at my face. <laughs> if you have data that's not very smooth, then when you spin it, usually your p values are going to be lower because it's not as affected by the spatial autocorrelation feature. Um, yeah, so that's, those are the three main parts. So with those tools, um, this kind of gets us to the last thing, which is to do the enrichment analysis. Again, like this could be for your own data or it could be for something that you're specifically interested in, like a specific map and near maps that you're interested in. And the kind of like, like a vanilla <laughs> version of, of doing this is that for each map, so let's say you have your example map for each one, you can get a empirical correlation coefficient, that's the red dot here, and then you get your null, distribution from your um, the, from the spatial nulls after transforming them so they're in the same space to be compared and then you have an idea of like you know if I have a data map so near maps can be used in different ways it can be used for hypothesis generation so for example in a very exploratory sense like just kind of going across like let's see which annotations what which hits do I get with my map let's say you have like a um, functional M MRI like task map and you want to know which, like the brain regions that I see lit up in this map, what kind of biological annotations are also enriched? Like what might be kind of the biological under, under um, biological mechanisms that are underpinning this, this uh, result that I'm getting? And you can use neuromaps to kind of help generate these hypotheses by doing a large exploratory kind of analysis in terms of looking at multiple different maps. Where do I get high correlations? Where do I get that there is also high density of whatever a specific receptor or gene expression or whatever? Um, and then follow that up with future analyses. But, just because NeuroMaps has a lot of data doesn't mean that you have to use it all. So this is like one of the examples that I, I like to give. This is an analysis that I did in a um, the receptor project that I was working on about the same time as NeuroMaps. And the idea here is that just because NeuroMaps has a lot of data, you don't have to use it all, right? Like you can come in with a hypothesis. So in this case, what we're doing is, if you imagine like you have a specific uh, disorder map. So in this case, what these are is case versus control cortical thickness maps. They're just coincidence values. So I have this kind of idea of where in the brain there is uh, cortical thinning or thickening, but usually it's thinning um, for a bunch of different disorders. And because I know, or like we kind of generally think of loss of receptor and neurotransmitter systems being implicated in, in um, disease propagation and just like pathology in general, I might be interested in which receptors, also because they can generally be good like pharma, pharmacological or pharmaceutical like targets, um, which it might be interesting to know which receptors are mapped onto this disorder Pattern. And so in this case, I'm using near mouse, but I'm just limiting my search to the receptor densities. So there's still quite a few, so 19 of them. But like, just, just to say that, you know, by all means use all the data, but like you don't have to. Like, don't feel overwhelmed. You come in with a hypothesis and like you're very specifically interested in, the, in, the, in one map and you can take that and do your analysis there. Um, and so, for example, in this case, what I'm showing is that for all these different disorder maps with, from the Enigma consortium, that's where these are coming from, I'm just doing a simple linear regression, or I guess a, mul a simple multiple linear regression model where my input variables are the receptor densities and my output variable is this disorder map. And so on the one hand, I can get an idea of how nice the fits are, which is, that's like relevant, but I think maybe more interesting is to dive into this dominance analysis, which I won't go into detail here, but I'm happy to talk about um, if you're interested. 
Um, but what this is, is just giving me an idea of which receptors are more or less implicated or contributing more or less to this model fit. And some things are kind of expected, like, okay, serotonin transporters showing up for a couple like mood disorders, things like that. But they're also like novel hits that we might not have seen otherwise without being able to do this kind of big data approach. I mean, by big data, it's like 19 maps, which is not big compared to big data, but like you get the idea. Instead of being very focused on the one map that you're collecting in your lab, you can like now make kind of bridges to other data from elsewhere. This okay. Is cortical thickness mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a cortical thickness case for control. So it's not um, longitudinal at all. It's just, yeah. 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 But yeah, so that's SNRMAPS. Um, it is available, so yeah, on, on PyPy. It's also on GitHub. Um, it is like totally open source, so you can go in and look at our code and see how it is we do things and like steal snippets. I mean, not steal, but you know, like take snippets of, of code and use that for your own work, for sure. Um, you can contribute to our open code and data, so like do open a pull request if you find something and you think you know how to either fix it if it's a bug, but also we've had, there's actually an open pull or an open like issue. We're pretty active on the GitHub issue, so you can ask questions or like, it doesn't have to be an actual issue, it can just be like a general question. And so one of the things on this GitHub issues is somebody um, found a way to do something we were doing in a much faster way. So like our method was taking like 14 minutes and his method is like 14 seconds. And it's like, yeah, it's like insane. <laughs> yeah, so like that kind of stuff, do let us know. Yeah, exactly, I was like, oh my gosh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so you can help us with that. It would be much appreciated, but also just general questions is fine too. Our documentation is pretty good, I would say, but like obviously it's good to know, when people use this, it's good to know where they stumble because then that's what tells us how to improve the documentation, documentation how to like explain these things. Um, so again, this is Ross, that's my lab funding, and here's the paper. So it is published, you can read it. It's like 10 pages long. It's, I mean, it's, I think it's nice. Like I'm not gonna diss the paper, it's a nice paper, but there's this really nice uh, commentary that Broadway Tech at UCSD wrote, which is two pages long, so it's like way shorter. And it just like gives you a really nice kind of, I don't know, I read this commentary after the paper was published, and you know, I was part of developing your maps, and I read this, and I was like, wow, your maps is so cool, I should go check out that tool, and like I was, yeah, so that's a really nice commentary I'd, I'd recommend. Um, yeah, so that's all I had in terms of slides. How are we doing for time? Oh yeah, this is great. One more question, so mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, generating hypotheses using neural maps. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what generating hypotheses is more that um, I may have derived a, a model of some sort. Mm -hmm. And that model um, is purporting a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so then I use that model to go ahead and get seek empirical validation. Mm -hmm. um, that's another way of generating hypotheses. So the example you gave was that, that finding, I want to see, I, I'm hypothesizing that that finding is really some sort of biological or something, yeah. Gene expression or receptor density, or some mm -hmm. combination thereof. But could you also use it to, in, in more that truly, um, some will say data mining in some respects. So you're not really using the data that you've collected to map onto neural maps, but actually just looking at the neural maps relationships to see if there are features that may not have been um, reported, mm -hmm. but may be consistent enough in neural maps that you should, should, you should see an empirically derivative go ahead and collect the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so I think, yeah, so actually, so that reminded me of, I have this hidden slide. It just sort of reminded me of that, so I'm going to go ahead and, you guys can still see my slide. Yeah, great. Um, here. Bye. So this is just kind of a semi example, but one thing we did, because we were, we were doing all these transforms, and one of the main questions was, well, when you transform, like, oh no, what if, what if we discover that you do this transformation and the correlations are totally different than maps? And so it's like, becomes kind of a case of, you know, be really careful when you transform data because it might like really mess up stuff and, you know, careful, careful, you know? But then we did it and there was like almost no change. And so we're like, okay, let's, well, I mean, it's good, but a little underwhelming. You know? yeah. Just like, okay, great, like everything's fine. But then because of that, what we could do is with all these, these different maps, we could kind of look at how are they similar to one another and different to one another in ways that we have not really been able to look at before because we haven't had all the data in the same place before. And, and you know how in literature we've been seeing more and more of this like sensory association axis, like everything looks like more Google's like the principal yeah, yeah, functional gradient. Great. But it's also like when you look at it, it's like is that that or is it kind of more when it like is it that map or is it a different map? And so what we just kind of tried to do with near maps is we took all the maps and we really were just looking at um, we, clustered them and just got an idea of, you know, are there maps that just all kind of look the same? And you can actually see, so we did this across the different spaces, but you can see that there are like two pretty nice clusters and one of them is a bit more anterior posterior and the other one's a bit more unimodal transmodal and that's the kind of thing you can't really do 
if you just have like the one data, you know, the one data set that you're working with. And so now with that, it kind of helps us organize like neuroscientific ontology a little bit, you know, like how do we interpret and mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so I think that's like, is this in the paper? it is, it's like figure five, or it's like one of the last figure. Yeah, oh, okay. it's, it's towards the end. It almost never gets talked about in talks. It's a hidden slide. Yeah, so what see. I find interesting also is that yeah. it's that uh, transition to like the um, spectral power. Mm -hmm, the beta power ramp, so yeah. They, they kind of move around, right? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't like, the ones that don't conform kind of tell you how you go from one to the other. Like what's the, yeah, for sure. And like what, what this is showing here is just like, um, the delta R's is the change in correlation between two maps in one space versus two maps in another space. And so the point here really was that the correlation coefficients don't change very much at all. And then like we tried to really fish, like is there any case where you see a correlation that's significant in one transformation not in the other? And the answer is yes, but then the, the p-value was like 0.049. So it's like, you know, like you could kind of, yeah, you can guess why. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of ways that your maps can be used. It doesn't, I think the one way at any rate, just at the level of grad students, like what I use it for is just like the kind of technical, being able to do those transforms, mm -hmm. the spatial models, the parsation that just like makes my life a lot easier instead of having to kind of implement those myself. myself. Um, but also people who have their data and then kind of already have a hypothesis, they know, okay, this ought to be related to the serotonin transporter map. Them, but where do you get the serotonin? You know, that's trying to help that help with that. And then the third is just the very exploratory. Let's just take a bunch of stuff and see like what shows up and, and see what we follow up with more. Of course, like with that, you have to be careful about um, false positives and proper like you know, multiple comparisons testing and whatnot because you're always going to find something when you look at enough maps. So, yeah. Questions? Good. Does, yeah. Any questions on the? the oh yeah. On Either, um, flip your hand or, or you can also type something in the chat window. Yeah, I, maybe while you give people some time, but um, are people planning to, so I'm um, planning to do this live demo thing. Do people want to code along or no? Like what's the vibe? Try code. We're doing this on Google Collab, so it's like, um, you're going to do exactly what I'm going to be doing. Like um, we're, I'm starting from scratch, like I'm starting from installing the thing. Yeah, are you planning? Yeah, okay, cool. So. I'll do that, and then we can kind of make sure that we're on the same page. Cool, that will be fun. Yeah, yeah. You'll see me do all my uh, typos. Uh, Obviously, I clear even to actually do that. The question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. You'll see like all the places where I mess up, and hopefully we don't run into a bug. That'd be embarrassing. But <laughs> um, okay, so the way we do this, so you're gonna have to be connected to the internet. I guess everybody's already connected to the internet. Great. And I'm just doing this in Google Cloud, so if you don't already know how you do, how you get here is you open Google Drive. I'm assuming you have a Google account. And then just as though you were to open a Google Doc, you just kind of go down and open, open a Google Cloud document, that's all. He's asking the question, where does he get the full link to, he wants to get to Google Cloud. Oh, um, it won't be my document. Everyone will be kind of having their own document and we'll be kind of coming together. But how you open this is you, um, log into your Google Drive account, and then you create a new document, but instead of a Google Doc, just find the collab. So like, you know how there's docs and slides and PowerPoint, well, not PowerPoint, but um, sheets. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And then the first thing we're gonna do is install near maps. So don't press enter yet. What you can just do is you could just do, you know what, let me, is there any way to get rid of this thing? Sorry, one second. So, near maps, documentation, there's also proper documentation. This is the actual, yeah. Um, you can, it is on PyPy, so you can pip install near maps. Or you can git clone the GitHub repo in that way if you want to change the code, which actually I've done a couple times. If there's something I'm like specifically want to fetch something, I'll go in and, and change that. But what I'll be doing here is I'll be installing the version that's on, on, um, on oh my gosh on GitHub directly. So not the version on PyPy because there hasn't been a release in some time and I just want to be using the most up-to-date version. Mm -hmm. So pip install git, what that is is, and then the link to the, let's just do it this way. Yeah. So that's the git command. Let's just double check that, that works. I'm gonna let that run. Um, and then from there we'll go and yeah, look for some stuff. 
Does anybody? So I, I kind of have like a sort of. What yeah. was the problem if we install the neurons? Like pip install neurons? Um, there's no problem. It's just a slightly older version because they're the so this version is the version that's on GitHub currently, the most up to date version. And pip install neurons is just the version that's been released on PyPy most recently. It's been a few months. It's like all good. It's just there's been updates since, and so I generally use the most um, current version. And I think we'll be doing a new release soon. So yeah. So for me, it installed properly. I'm just going to get rid of the output message. Let me know when you guys are have new maps. Oh yeah, yeah. No worries, no worries. And does anyone have like specific data maps that you want me to fetch? Or anyone have like specific things you want me to try? Or should I just go and like do kind of a general? Try and break it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I could do that. Let's run some volumetric nulls using yeah, uh, yeah. the burnt version and see that it completely explodes. Yeah, I mean, who knows? This is Google's cluster, so maybe it works. Good? Going okay? I'll move on. Yeah? Okay. So one of the first things, okay, so near maps, the code is organized kind of in a couple um, like main, I guess, sub packages. So let's install those. Import transforms we'll use, transforms we'll use to go from different spaces to one another. Nulls is for the spatial nulls. Uh, data sets is for fetching data. Um, I do not recommend near maps for plotting because really what we're doing is we're just wrapping the nylearn like plotting functionality and you probably have nicer plotting that you do yourself, but there is like a very not the best looking plotting thing that you can do just to like double check that things look okay. Um, and then near maps has this really great document images, which I'll show you actually. So this is something that I think people don't know about because it's not really promoted as, it's like a helper document to just like do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. But if you're ever working with your imaging data and it's like not in the right format and you're not sure how to like load it or deal with it, just double check this images Python document for functions. Um, it might solve your issue. Like I, I use this all the time, even though it's not really kind of, it's not something that we promote really, or it's like not a selling point, but yeah. So that's me importing stuff and let's just find out how many how many maps there are near maps. So to do that, um, <laughs> oh my gosh, print near, sorry, data sets. So the, we have two kind of main functions in data sets. There's available annotations and fetch annotations. Fetch is for actually downloading, available just to see what's there. So if I do, uh, plural, if I do this, let's see if this works. Uh, okay, wait, print the length of that, please instead of every single one. Um, there's 72 maps in your maps right now. So again, this hasn't downloaded anything on your machine. This is just um, getting an idea of what's available. And we can print a few, let's say like, yeah, um, for annotation and available annotations. Wait. <laughs> I can't code when people are watching me, sorry. There's the available annotations. Print annotation, okay. That's right, right? Okay, bingo. So here you can see all the data that we have. And sorry, there, so you can see what's what I, what I wrote. Um, they're listed alphabetically right now. And the way that they're organized, source, so where do we get the data from? Okay, this is actually a bad example. Let's do this one. Source, usually the first author, the last name of the first author of the paper in the year it was published. So in this case, it's a Bellybo et al. 2017 paper. Um, description for the pet images, these are the tracer names. So for these, it's gonna to be totally obscure, like what is this tracer? And that's where you go in to look at the annotation kind of tape, master table, which exists on the near maps GitHub account in the wiki. The reason is, anyways, not important. So there's this table in the wiki, and here you can see all the information. So here like this map, the tracer name is a bit obscure, hard to know what it is, but you can see here it's a 5H21B serotonin receptor. And there's 36 individuals, 26 males, age range, Pretty young, here's the paper to cite if you use that data. Um, and that exists for all these. So for example, HCP data. So here's from the HCP S1200 release, we have the MEG beta power distribution map. It is an F solar space. It's 4,000 vertices per hemisphere approximately. We also have the um, cortical thickness in T1, T2, which we call myelin map, which I know is like not 
which probably just call it 222, but in any case, um, 32,000 vertices. So that just gives you an idea of how it's um, organized. You don't have to use all four of those parameters to fetch data. So let's say we want, is there any, anybody have like a favorite map, a specific map that you guys are interested in, or should I just pick a random? Going once, going twice, random. Critical thickness it is, classic. Data set stuff, fetch annotation. So that's how you get the data. Um, in this case, I, I just know, because I've done this a couple times, so I know that HCPS 1200, that's the source, and the description is thickness. You don't need to give all the information. In fact, in this case, I, because I'm, I know what's in your maps, I know that there's only one map where the description is thickness, so you could just give description thickness, and it's, it'll be happy with that. If there are multiple things, let's just test this. So print CT. Um, for example, if I take, what's a map that has multiple? Oh, I know, okay, GABA, the GABA receptor. Fetch annotation. So in this paper, Norgard 2021, they provide this GABA receptor, but they provide it in two formats, MLI 152 and FS average. And the recommendation is that you use the FS average version, but I'll just download it to show you what happens. So I have, I'm fetching the cortical thickness data, I'm fetching the GABA data. You can see that it's downloading from an OSF repository, which is open, you can like look at that yourself. The reason is that we can't store all the data on GitHub, it's just like too much data GitHub can't handle. Um, so we're fetching the data from a different repository, it downloads it onto your local machine. This is GitHub Collab, so it's not gonna be on your local machine, but like it's in a temporary place where you can still access it. But if you're running this like on your local Python, and, um, yeah, then it'll be downloaded in root slash your map data, I think, and you can find the data there. And if you want, you could just download the data, take those maps and like do, use your other software that you usually use and, and run with that, that's totally fine. Um, and then how it is represented in your maps, as you can see, so here it's telling me that it's downloading the data and then this is where I printed out cortical thickness, this thing right here. And what this is, is it's just a, a list of the file path. So that's another thing, I, sometimes I get the question like, oh, how do I load my own data into near maps? All you do is you give the file path. Like near maps just deals with the file path, so you don't, there's no loading, you know what I mean? Like it's just provide the file path and it'll, it'll run with that. And in the file name, if you look closely, you'll see that it is organized by the exact same way that is organized near maps, which is the source, where did it come from, um, what's the description of the data, what space is it in, what density is it, and then in this case we always separate by hemisphere if it's surface, so left and right. If it's volumetric, then it's just one map. Um, yeah, so if you're ever wondering what was the space again of this map, just look at the file name, it's right there. I mean, you can also load it in and see the length of the array, but yeah. And then I wanted to tie, like for GABA, when I downloaded that, you'll see, where's the print? Oh yeah. Uh, Bingo, here. Um, because there is more than one data map with source Norgard 2021, it's down, it returns a dictionary where the keys are the different data maps and the value is the path to that data. And in this case, there's a warning that says data from, you know, Bellevue 2017 and, and Norgard 2021 is best used in the provided FS average space. So it's just letting you know you should be using the FS average, not the MLI-152, unless you're specifically interested in the subcortex values. Okay, um, I'm also just gonna quickly grab the mu opioid, opioid map because it's an MLI-152 and I'm gonna be transforming them, so it's just for the sake of this example. Annotation, description is carfentanil. What is the source? I am going to double check. <laughs> That's a bad way of double checking. I'm gonna double check here. Trutonin, I think. Yeah, okay, so I'm grabbing this map, Trutonin 2020. So you can see, like, I don't, I don't have them memorized. Like, I'm looking them up as well. Tortonin. Okay, I'm just gonna fetch that, and I'll print out that I fetched it, just to make sure I have those maps. And then, so one of them is in 32K space, that's the cortical thickness. The other one is in MLI-152 space, so I'm gonna wanna convert the MLI-152 to the 32K. And so how I do that is I use transform, so let's say more in FSLR. FSLR, because I know that cortical thickness is in FSLR, if you wanna check, you can just see where I printed it. It's in space FSLR. Um, so I already imported the transform subpackage, so I'll just say MNI152 to FSLR. And that's all it is, that's the function. And you have to provide your map in MNI, so that's the more map. 
MOR is mu opioid receptor. So you guys, the super receptor map. Um, the what space do I want it in? F oh, density is 32K. And I'm waiting for that pop up because I don't remember. It's not popping up. OK, well. So this is what I do when I'm like not sure what the, um, what the parameters of the function are. I just go to, oh, you can also check it out in the actual documentation. I, I tend to do this. I don't know why. It just makes more sense to me, I guess. But to FSLR. Image, the density we want it in, that's fine. Method, linear, that's fine as well. So this is good with me. So I'll just leave it at that. And let's print the output of that. And then also, I'm going to, from near maps images import, oh, wait, I already loaded images. Print images.load data mor fslr shape. So what I'm doing here, first, I'm going to transform the m 9 map to fslr. Oh. Okay, so what it's downloading is the different surfaces to be able to do that transform. And it's done, and I printed out the output of the transformation. So what this is, it's a tuple of gifty images. So just like that, it's kind of maybe a bit hard to interpret, but if you want to like load it in, I just did load data, which is coming from a neural maps function. This is really just wrapping NiBabel's like um, load. And you can see it is 64,000 vertices long. That's the two hemispheres concatenated, so it's 34,000 for one, 34,000, uh, approximately 34,000 each. And that's correct. So we're no longer at, for example, print MOR. Sorry, guys. So that was the shape of the original volumetric map. You can see it's volumetric, and now it's surface map. So that's like, that was pretty easy, right? Like, so if you have map data that you want to transform, you can do it. Um, let's do a spatial null model. So let's just calculate, like make that null so we can make that comparison. I'm going to spin the, the version that hasn't been transformed. That's a personal preference. I tend to like to do things that involve as few steps as possible. So instead of transforming and then calculating the spin, since I have the version that has, since I have the cortical thickness map, which I haven't touched at all, it's just the original, I'll just compute the nulls on that. So I'm going to call that rotated. Um, I already imported nulls. I'm going to do Alexander Block, but you could do anything. What are you doing? Alexander Block. So you need to provide the data. That's cortical thickness. What's the atlas? It's FSLR. No, it's FSLR. I don't remember right now if I need to capitalize FSLR, but we'll see. Density is 32,000. Um, waiting for the pop-up. I don't need a parcellation. I'm going to do 100 permutations. I would recommend you do at least 1,000. I usually do 10,000. Usually what I do, like in all honesty, is I do 1,000, get an idea, and then like once I'm kind of finalizing my analysis, I just rerun everything with 10,000, like let it take its time. Um, so let's say n perm equals 100, just because I don't want to take it too long right now. OK, and then I'll print out this shape of that. Anybody have questions? Am I going too fast? Like is people are following or anything that I should do again or? Okay, so it's going to take a hot second, not too long. And it is doing that thing where it projects it to the sphere, spins data, it's going to return the data that's rotated. Okay, trick of the trade. So you can do this where you provide data. There we go. So we have this, the data map, that's how big it is. And then I made 100 permutations, so you now have 100 permutations. And what you can do is you don't have to use neural maps. You can just like use that manually and loop through every single map, calculate a new correlation coefficient. That's fine. You can also use neural maps, it kind of does it under the hood. But you could also just take that and like loop through. OK, trick of the trade. Here, what I'm doing is I'm returning the data spun, which means that you can only reuse that if you're interested in correlating it to that map, obviously, because that's the it's that data that's been spun. Now, what I do in my own work is I very often set data equals none and, re and generate the parcellations on no data. Because remember, spin, the spin test does not require the data. It just requires the surface. So what I do here is I generate the indices. This will re return the indices needed to spin. And then you can reuse that for anything, which is like that way you're not regenerating the spins every time you do like, for example, if you're correlating your map with like 100 different maps and you have to regenerate spins every time, that's like going to take a while. Here I do it once, I get the indices, and I reuse those indices. Make sense? So yeah, that's my uh, kind of way of making things faster. Um, let's compare them. Did I import stats? I don't think I did. I didn't. OK, so I'm going to do that. Your maps has a kind of one size fits all 
um, function called compare images. I think that's what it's called. And that's what we're going to use. So, wait, let me actually. Okay, so the first, you're comparing images, so you're comparing two things. The first thing is going to be the cortical thickness. The second thing is the mu opioid receptor, but in FSLR space, because otherwise it's not in the same space and you can't compare them. Um, this is important that cortical thickness comes first because it assumes that the thing that comes first is the thing that matches the nulls. So just be aware of the order there. Um, Pearson correlation is fine. You can do whichever similarity metric you want. Like you can also provide your own function and then just like do that. But we have a default, which is Pearson correlation. That's fine. Um, nulls, I did compute. So I'm going to give it the rotated data. And then there's an option. This is a very recent pull request actually. So near maps, if you did pip install near maps, you won't be able to do return nulls. It's not on the most updated version, but I find it very useful to return those nulls because then I can see the distribution and just make sure that things look reasonable instead of just kind of trusting that the null, nulls worked, which I mean, you should be able to trust it, but still. So, okay. So what this is doing is going to do a correlation coefficient, which is very basic. So this is the same from just doing any kind of Pearson R. The p-value is going to be a spin, a p-spin. So it takes into account spatial autocorrelation because I provided the nulls. And then null distribution is going to give me the, this, the, all the, yeah, all the null correlations that I computed. So in this case, it will just be 100 of them. But if you're doing this for your own analysis, I do recommend at least 1,000. So let's do that. Rho equals the correlation coefficient. P-spin equals the p-value, and I'm just also going to print null dist.shape. I don't want to print everything because it's 100 values, but just to prove. Okay, we have a significant correlation between cortical thickness and mu opioid. Correlation of 0.6, and let's from matplotlib.pyplot import. No, that's not right. Import matplotlib.pyplot. I'm just going to plot the Histogram? No, that's box. So here I'm just plotting the correlation coefficient and then I'm going to plot the box plot of the null distribution. Let's see if this works. Oh wait, I think I need to do... Oh, what's it called? Null dist? Okay, that's my correlation coefficient, empirical. That's an L distribution. It makes sense that the p-value is essentially zero. I don't know if you guys know, but like how I'm calculating p-value here is that we count the number of times that my null is greater than my empirical plus one divided by number of null plus one. So it's impossible to get a p-value of zero because the smallest p-value you can get is one divided by number of nulls plus one. So one divided by 101 in this case. That's what this value is, one divided by 101. Because you can see there are no nulls that go above this. And so that's... That's what you're doing. And so what, what I showed you here, um, here, yes, here. Oh, that was another hidden slide. Anyway, so here's just an example of I'm doing that, but for like a bunch of different maps. Let me share the screen. Yeah, so I'm doing exactly what we just did. Um, first, I have a map. I transform it to the target space or whichever one's smaller. Um, Neuromaps does have a function called resample images where instead of doing it based on space, you can just provide two data sets to tell it which space it is. The default is down sample, and it'll under the hood call like MI152 to FSLR or whatever. So that's what I did here. I just resampled them so that they're the same space, whichever one is smaller. Did my spin test, got all my box plots. The box plots are the nulls. We just plotted the empirical values here. And then I can calculate which ones are significant based on the p-value, but also after multiple comparisons. And then that's how you get an analysis like this. Make sense? Does anybody work with parcelated data? Is that a thing that you guys do? Not really? OK. Because if you did, I would show you. But if not, then I, maybe I should ch check the chat. Wait. Uh, chat. Oh, OK. OK, I'll show you guys the how we do it. Um, how we work with parcelated data, and that'll be the last thing I do. Um, because yeah, so for me, I'm always, almost always using parcelated data, in which case the transforms aren't so much to compare maps, it's more to get it into a space where I can parcelate it, because sometimes it's not in the space that your parcelation file is in. So to parcelate, first is you need to import the parcelator, so from neuromaps.parcelate, 
import parselator. It's kind of cute, call the parselator. And you need to have your parselation file. So that file, it's kind of which, wherever you get your parselation file. So I get my parselation file from, we have like a lab GitHub thing. It's public, you can use it. Um, pip install, I just need to install it. HTTP. Okay, sorry guys. I just need to install this to catch, to get my parselation file, but really you just need your, um, the path to your file. And so from here, from that neuro tools .data sets, import fetch. You guys know what the Schaefer parsellation is? Are you familiar with Schaefer? I'll explain. So Schaefer is a uh, functional parsellation, which actually I think the recommendation, they very recently came up with like an updated version. That's correct, I think. Um, so what it is, is it's a uh, functional parsellation based on fMRI data. It is has different resolutions from 100 brain regions to 1,000 brain regions. I'm going to be fetching the 400 brain regions, what I usually use in my work, but you can use whatever. Oh, do I have to do this first? Hit install. Oh, wait. Git plus. There you go. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take that um, you opioid map or the cortical thickness map doesn't really matter and then i will parcelate it to those 400 brain regions and then the output will be a, a map that's length 400 instead of length 60 whatever a thousand 69,000. Uh, and then you would have to do that for all your data so you'd go through and loop through parcelate it individually based on your file which again could be anything that's completely any brain tone, whatever as long as you have the mapping from like m9152 to the 400 parcels or from fsr or whatnot and you can go with that. Okay, so this is installed. I'm just gonna double check what my parcellation file. This is just me getting my parcellation file, so I mean you can do it this way, but you can do it however you want. Um, Net Neuro Tools. You know what? I'm having second thoughts. I feel like there's an easier way to do this from Nylearn. Do you guys know what Nylearn is? Yeah, okay, so Nylon has a Schaefer. Nylon is just another Python toolbox that's like very popular with neuroimaging people. They have a fetch Schaefer, so instead of going through that like other GitHub repo, I think this is easier. What's it called? Nylon datasets fed Atlas Schaefer. Atlas Schaefer, okay. And then I'm gonna just fetch that. I think I need to give it the number of regions. Yeah, and ROIs. And I'll print out what that is just so you guys know. Um, so what the Schaefer thing, that's the parcellation. So you can see the list of brain regions. They're, there's um, listed by hemisphere and they have kind of different names like limbic network and it's like the fourth temporal pole parcel and whatnot. So you'll have the same thing for your parcellation file. And then there's this thing at the end which is Schaefer maps. And that is the file path to the parcellation file. So you can see that this is an MNI 152 space. This is a, an image in 152 space that's mapping every voxel to a parcel in Schaefer 400. So this will be the same as your parcellation file. It'll be mapping every voxel or every vertex in, in whatever space. And then how I parcellate is, okay, so first we need to make a parcellator using that parcellation function from um, near maps. Um, the parcellation file, which I just, made, so Schaefer maps, and the space that it's in, it's an M9152. So that's the parcellator that's gonna do the work for you. You just need to make sure it's in the right space. And then what we do, MOR is originally in M9152 space, so I want this now in Schaefer 400, or let's just call it park. Parcellator, fit transform. Um, my original image, what's the space? Oops. And then print the shape of that. So I just went from my volumetric image. I now have it in 400 brain regions. It was one function. You can loop through if you need to. So sometimes for me, I'll have a bunch of data in different spaces. And so you'll need the parcellation file in those different formats. If you don't have that, use NearMaps transform and you can transform it into the different spaces. Oh, that's another, I mean, this is a very small detail and it probably was not easy to remember, but um, if you have a parcellation file that's in the format 
in the wrong format and you want to transform it. What NeuroMaps does when it transforms, it takes the average of the parcels that are mapping onto a different parcel of a different space, right? But that's not ideal for parcelations because you want all your numbers to be discrete. It's supposed to be a label, like one matches to parcel one and all the voxels with one map to that, all the parcels with two map to the parcel two. If you take the average and you have a parcel that's 1.5, of course that doesn't mean anything anymore. So just so you know, when you're doing the transforms, there is an option. Usually we do method linear, that's just an average. If you do method nearest neighbor, I think that's what it is, then it takes the mode, right? So then you'll end up with a map of discrete values, which you can use, you can use that parcelation file for um, data that you have in a different space in the original parcelation file. Make sense? And your maps does also like, you can take these, these parcelated data, and if you do, if you compute the spins on the parcelated level, you can do exactly what we did before, the com compare images, and just provide the parcelation as well, and then it, it happens. Um, it calculates the p-value, the p-spin value, um, using the parcelation. By the way, doing spin tests or any kind of spatial null model, parametric anything, is way faster at the parcelated level, obviously, because it's 400 regions or 1,000 regions like max, instead of 16,000 or 164,000 or whatever the heck. So. Um, that is one plus of working at the parcelated level. Just makes things faster. Good. Anybody have questions? Anything that they want me to do? Try to break, you know, find bugs. Um, spe specific use cases that you're curious about. I kind of went through the main, main things, I think. I should check this chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me know if the parcelated, I think there's people on Zoom who are happy to see the parcelation. So if I can go into that in more detail or whatnot, let me know. But otherwise, this is like my main, my main shtick. Cool. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. Thanks.